Thanks a lot, guys. The tragic plane crash in Santee Monday is raising a lot of questions about what could have happened. Joining us now to give us an analysis on the accident is aviation attorney and very accomplished pilot Michael Curran. Michael, thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning, Jason. Glad to be with you guys. Uh, I first want to recognize uh, what a tragedy it is. I mean, two very fine gentlemen were lost in this tragedy, so our hearts go out to their families and their friends and the folks who lost homes as well. So, um, uh, like I say, we, we offer them our sympathies. Yes, we do. And uh, everything at this point, Michael, will acknowledge is speculation, but we want to, this is for our purposes, it's kind of an educated guess here based upon what we know so far. You have come down to three more likely possibilities. Let's talk about the events leading up and why, how you came to those conclusions. Sure. Uh, so, you know, NTSB is investigating and they'll come up with their report and that'll be the, uh, the, the real opinion. Um, but uh, as an experienced attorney and, and pilot, there's a couple of things in this accident chain that, I caught, that caught my attention right away. As uh, Dr. Doss is speaking to ATC, he's setting up for what's called an ILS approach, an instrument landing service approach, which means he's most likely in the IMC, instrument meteorological condition. So he's in the clouds, he has to rely on his instruments. And what happens that's unusual as we lead up to the, the accident itself is that as he's being vectored onto the ILS, he's being offered instructions uh, to the localizer by ATC. He seems to be acknowledging those instructions, but he doesn't seem to be complying with those instructions. They give him vectors to the ILS, the final approach course, and then as you can see on the graphic that you have up, he appears to make a left-hand turn off the localizer, flies back through the localizer, his speed's increasing, so he most likely is descending, so it appears that he's lost situational awareness. A number of things could have happened. He could have lost an engine, he could have lost an instrument, or he could have just been situationally uh, disoriented. That, that happens, depends upon how his instrument scan is going. Another uh, po possibility is that he was incapacitated. He was a 63-year-old man, I believe, um, uh, you know, possibly a heart event or some event that caused him to lose consciousness. And it's about at this time when the uh, ATC instructor issues a, an emergency, you're too low, a terrain warning, that we see the aircraft. It seems to coincide with the video, and we see the aircraft coming out of the clouds in, in kind of a, a nose down, about 30, 40 degrees nose down position like this. And as he goes visual, meaning he's now out of the clouds, he could have very easily, if he was alert and conscious, he could have very, it's an unusual attitude, but he could have just rolled the wings and it seems to be a recoverable, unusual attitude, but he didn't do that. So that would suggest to me that he is either unconscious or incapacitated in some way, because as he came out of those clouds, even if he was spatially disoriented in the clouds, once he went visual, he should have been able to recover the aircraft. Yeah, a very good point. You and I talked on the phone earlier this morning about this, leading up to the interview. What strikes me here is that uh, the doctor owned this 340, and it was the one that he owned that he was he, he crashed and was killed in. But this is a flight from Yuma, Arizona, to Montgomery Field, which is kind of a straight shot. There's not a lot of turns, and by all accounts, he had done this a lot of times before. For him to depart the localizer when it's a straight shot into 2-8 right at Montgomery, that seems kind of, in, that, that, and then when he does the course correction, if we can show that graph again, and the turn is to the right, it's almost like a, I don't know, a, 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 a 200 degree turn, whatever it is. There's no, no course correction whatsoever. If this was a medical emergency, something, and this is a cardiologist who probably, if that were the case, would know the symptoms. It didn't have to be sudden. It could have slowly come on, and he might have been in a situation where he realized, I've got something bigger going on in this cockpit. Yeah, I, I think that that is a possibility. Uh, you know, we're kind of speculating at this point, but, but what lends uh, credibility to that theory is that that turn as he goes, uh, turns to the north, his, it seems to be a descending turn as we listen to the ATC tapes and we see the flight path of the aircraft. It's a descending right-hand turn and there's no correction whatsoever. Even though he's getting calls from ATC, he seems to be acknowledging the calls, but he's not complying with the calls. So. Um, what's going on in this co that cockpit is disorientation and at some point probably unconsciousness or incapacitated. But to your earlier point, when he came out of those clouds, as you said, his wings aren't level, he's on a knife edge, but as you said, he could have just leveled the wings, pulled the power back and uh, got back into altitude, right? Yeah, it's, it's what's called an unusual attitude and we're trained for unusual attitude. So a nose blow, unusual attitude like that is pull the power back, 
level the wings and recovered the aircraft. And and even though he was, it looked like he was doing an excess of about 250 knots. So the speeds were very high uh, for this aircraft in in that flight situation. But uh, they were not excessively high that they were unrecoverable. He could have simply pulled the power back, leveled his wings, and recovered the aircraft once he came into visual conditions. And I think one thing that's noteworthy here, should go, looking at possibility number two, a medical emergency, in the case of a heart attack, hands and arms can be compromised physically. So maybe there was a chance that, that something happened where he was having a hard time with altitude, with turning. He held it into that right-hand turn. But again, coming out of those clouds, it was recoverable. Yeah, and, and if it was a heart event or something like that, I mean, a heart events can come on slowly and they can come on very rapidly. Right. So a, a severe heart attack could have completely disoriented or incapacitated him, which would explain why he didn't recover once he came out of the clouds. As you know, once you come, once you go visual and you see you're in that nose down, high speed, unusual flight attitude, power back, level the wings, and it was very recoverable, but it didn't look like any flight input was made as the aircraft descended in that same unusual attitude unfortunately, into the ground, into the houses, and to the, the UPS yeah. truck. Um, how, how did, from a legal standpoint, uh, can you tell us what we could be looking at as far as uh, liability, wrongful death, things like that? Sure. There's going to be multiple claims here. The, the, the first claim is going to be a wrongful death action on behalf of Mr. Kruger's family or, or, or spouse and, and kids. Um, the uh, additional claims are going to be the homeowner's uh, some of the homeowners were injured, so there's going to be personal injury claims. And, of course, there's going to be property damage claims that initially may be borne by the homeowner's insurance, but they, of course, will seek subrogation from the uh, pilot's insurance. I, I don't know the level of insurance. Typically, about a million, maybe two million or five million uh, general liability policy of insurance on an aircraft like that. But that's probably not going to be sufficient to address these multiple claimants. And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Doss's personal assets are probably going to come into play once the insurance has paid out policy limits. Any other observations you have to make about this? I mean, we, we know we're going to be waiting for the NTSB report, but given the fact that that plane was making power right up until the moment it hit the ground, we might never know. Yeah, and, and given the severity of the crash, you, had a, you have a, about a 5,500-pound airplane doing 250 miles an hour or better. That was like a bomb going off in that neighborhood. That, the impact forces from that crash were tremendous. So even after NTSB tries to put things back together and take a look at the, the uh, wreckage and, and those, there's, uh, you know, if we say this in these kind of crashes, there's not going to be a lot of big pieces from that airplane. There's no black box, uh, no, no kind of reporting on the aircraft. So putting this back together, what happened in the last few seconds in that or last few minutes in that cockpit, is going to be a real challenge for NTSB. So we may never know exactly what happened in those last few minutes of that flight. All right. Michael Curran, an accomplished aviator, aviation attorney. Michael, thank you so much for your time and perspective this morning. We sure appreciate it. Always a pleasure to be of service to KUSI.